So the first part of the lecture was about uh, optimization algorithms that are typically used uh, in deep learning to optimize the task function associated with neural network training, uh, finishing with uh, the functioning of Adam, which is the, the go-to method that largely outperforms the others in, in many cases. And now, in the rest of the lecture, we are going to revert that uh, process, uh, that thought process again uh, a bit by not thinking of how we can optimize neural networks, but on the contrary, how we can use uh, machine and deep learning techniques to uh, enhance optimization algorithms. So it's really the other way around. And it's going to be related to uh, an emerging uh, <laughs> research topic, which is called learning to optimize. Uh, which basically tries to learn optimization algorithms using training data. So that's what we're going to talk about today in various flavors. So a bit of motivation first, just to present you two problems that uh, are very suitable for those kinds of techniques and that are both related to non-differential um, non optimization. One of them uh, is related to uh, fast regression. So here in that example, and I think in the next uh, or the, in one of the following lectures about dynamic systems and deep learning, Said will probably go over that example in more depth. But here, to, to motivate the problem, let's assume that we have a, a time series of observation data, okay? So X, Y, Z. And uh, we would like to know, we know that it's a dynamic system and that there's a differential equation underlying the, the evolution of this, var this variable. And what we would like, what we would like to do is from data only to recover the governing equations and to identify the physics from the data, just from observing the time series data. So here in the example, the true dynamical system is this one. It's the so-called Lorentz system, if you're familiar with it, line 63, where you have this differential equation that is uh, nonlinear because there are terms uh, involving x and y uh, or, uh, or x and z. Uh, and we assume that we have training available training data that follows this differential equation. So it has been obtained by numerical integration of this equation. And what we would like to do is identify the terms of the of the equation. So one way of doing it is uh, what is done in the in the CV method. Uh, you have a reference here if you want, is to compute the numerical derivatives of those time series, so x dot, y dot, z dot, and look for possible parameterization of the differential equation. So to do that, uh, what we can do is build a dictionary of possible terms. So here we know, or we can make the assumption that the true dynamical system will have a differential equation that is polynomial in, its, uh, in the variable. So here we build different time, different terms, x, y, z, but also x squared, x, y, x, z, etc. And we hope that the true uh, differential equation is uh, accounts for some of these terms at least. And we want to find which ones uh, best fit the data. So to do that, uh, we assume that uh, x dot is equal to a linear combination of some of these uh, dictionary entries, some of these, these variables, x, y, z, x, x, y, x, z, x, y, z, etc. And the problem is to find coefficients of this decomposition that best match the data in a least square step. So it's a simple least squares problem where you want to estimate the coefficients uh, of, the, of the different dictionary uh, elements that fit the data and allow to explain uh, the, the evolution. And you have an additional assumption, an additional um, uh, information is that you know that typically if you build a large catalog of possible terms, say up to uh, fourth or fifth order, or you may add sine, cosine, or spatial gradient, uh, etc. Only a few of them are going to be actually involved in the equation because the equations are typically simple, they don't involve too many things. So that's an assumption that you may want to add to your least squares estimation. So you want to find uh, the solution to a uh, least squares problem under the constraint that there are not too many terms that are active in those coefficients. You want to find what we call a sparse linear combination. Because here, among all those possible terms, I only have uh, six or seven of them that are actually active. And my dictionary can be much larger than that. So one way of doing that is to try to, to find solutions that respect this property. Uh, and more generally, if you have a signal 
that can be decomposed into a linear combination of a large number of uh, potential modes or primitive signals or atoms. Uh, we can write it that way, it's a simple linear equation. But if you know that the coefficients here, x, are sparse, means that a lot of these entries are going to be zero, you have to solve a, a, a linear system with sparse free constraints. And in some cases, just doing the least squares estimation is not possible. Uh, because in some cases, you, are, you, are, you have an underdetermined, an underdetermined linear system with less uh, unknowns than equation. Uh, yeah, less than, than unknown, less unknowns than equation. So in that case, you have an infinite number of solutions. It's not the case in this case example, but it can happen in practice. But in, even in that case, you know that if the coefficients are sparse enough, if you have only a few entries that are not zero, uh, you can find an exact solution in some cases if you are able to impose that sparsity free constraint. So to do that, uh, a typical way of solving it is to solve a linear uh, a least squares problem where your unknown is x, the coefficients you're looking for a with your dictionary atoms. So you just want to find uh, the coefficients of each column of that uh, dictionary and match it to your data, which is b in that case. And if you want x to be sparse, so a lot of zeros, one quantity that measures that is the so called L0 norm, which is just the number of non zero entries in a vector. Problem is, uh, if I put this quantity here in an optimization problem, it's something that's non differentiable and very hard to work with. So in practice, we often re re replace it with that quantity, which is called the L1 norm. It's just the sum of absolute values of the entries. And you can show that in some cases, it's actually also enforces that sparsity condition. If you add that regularization term to your least squares estimate, you are going to um, uh, force some entries of x to be zero, and the number of en such entries is going to be dependent on that parameter lambda that you have to fix at right hand. So the higher lambda, the sparser your solution. And if lambda is zero, you, you come back to the classical least squares estimate where X is most likely going to be dense in the sense that none of the entries are actually going to be zero. And uh, some entries will be typically small, small just to fit the data better. <coughs> so this problem is ubiquitous in, in, in signal processing and machine learning. The problem is even though uh, that is simpler than the, the L0 norm, it's still non-differential. So we have to handle that uh, uh, anyhow, and we also have to estimate that parameter lambda. Just a, a, a brief idea of why the L1 norm enforces sparsity. Uh, the previous optimization problem, we squared under uh, a, sparse, a sparse regularizer with the L1 norm, is equivalent to that one, minimizing the least squares resi residual subject to the fact that the L1 norm is going to be small smaller than some constant that I choose. And just to give a, a brief idea of why this enforces sparsity, we can have a look at this drawing here, where um, in the right picture, you can see the minimization of a, of a function like that, that is quadratic in X, um, under the constraint that the L2 norm is not too big. So here in blue, you have the, the level sets of that function, meaning the all the LCs here are the sets of uh, values for which the function is constant. And for quadratic functions, we know that those are going to be LCs. So ideally, if I don't have the constraint, what I'm looking for is the, this point here, which is a, a value, uh, the, the bottom of the value of my function. But I have a constraint. So my constraint is that my L2 norm must not be too large. And here we have represented in red the uh, the ball of the, of the L2 norm with radius lambda. And I know that I need to be on this ball as well. This is my constraint. So I'm looking for the point that is the, is the smallest for that function while being on the, on the ball. So I'm, I'm, my solution is here. So it's not the true solution because they are regularized. So I have another um, solution that is not the global minimum of that function, but this property of a small L2 might be desirable. For example, in machine learning, we often use that to avoid overfitting. With the L1 norm, it's going to be different. Why? Because the unit ball or the ball of radius lambda does not have the same shape. 
is very pointy, meaning that you have a large, uh, uh, potentially large number depending on the dimension. Here it's in dimension two that are corners of spiky points in your, in your ball. And those points, since they are extreme on that ball, are going to tend to attract the solution because if you project, if you take the smallest value uh, of that function that is on that ball, in many cases, you are going to fall in the corner. In larger dimensions, you are going to form facets of uh, some kind of uh, uh, square of floating around in space. <coughs> and so in practice, this means that the solutions are going to have zeros in them because you're in the axis. So that's why the L1 norm and Porter's part two. So the goal is to be able to solve that optimization problem. Okay, another example, um, maybe more related to image processing. Let's assume that we have an image with n pixels, so we vectorize it into a vector uh, that, that is corrupted by noise or by uh, uh, a blur or something like that. Here it's noise. So what we observe is a noisy image that is the sum of the, the uncorrupted image plus some noise um, that usually we take Gaussian, but it depends on the problem. And what we would like to do is to solve an optimization problem here to recover the, the clean image. So what we look for is to uh, we look for an image x that is close to y in the sense that it must look like this image still, but have another additional property that the noisy image does not have, and that noiseless images do have. So the question is, what should I choose for R in order that the solution of these optimization problems look more like this than this? So there are several. Uh, ways of, of, of looking at the problem. But if you were to uh, say the property that this image has that this one does not have, what would you say? Okay, this is noisy, this is not noisy. So what uh, properties on X should I choose so that I have something smoother than that? Yeah, yeah, images are very correlated spatially. So one thing that you could expect from a clean image is that uh, adjacent pixels have close values in most cases. Actually, it is, this is not exactly true here because you have uh, large, you have gradients, spatial gradients that are going to be very large uh, because you have noise. And here it's going to be much smoother. So one idea would be to choose as this term, something that forces the gradients, the spatial gradients of my pixels to be small. Okay, so let's try. So we are doing exactly that. Same problem, except that here I'm, had, I'm having a, bit, a second term that just computes the spatial gradients of my, uh, of my image, X, and, and takes the norm, so that the, no, the gradients are small on average. Um, so in order to work with that in practice, I need to, to say what it means uh, to take the spatial gradients, so I have to discretize them on my on my pixel grid. So to do that, I'm using uh, first order uh, difference operators, thin difference operators. For example, I'm just taking one pixel minus its neighbor, horizontal neighbor, and I have a I have a horizontal grid. Okay, same thing works case. And this is what I represent in this expression here. This operation is linear, so I can represent that with a linear uh, a matrix uh, multiplied by my my vector even though I'm working with image distance because the matrix is going to have a, a blocky structure to account for the, the first order differences. So I'm looking for the minimum of that problem now. If, if I want, I can rewrite it in a compact way so that I have both horizontal and spatial gradients in the same vector if I want. So I have, I'm going to end up with a, um, a vector that has twice the dimension uh, of the initial uh, vector because they have horizontal gradients and vertical gradients. But this is just more compact and I need to solve it. Good news is this is easy to solve. This is something that's smooth, differentiable, and you're gonna have a closed form solution in that case. So it's a, a quadratic problem. So you can show <coughs> by just computing derivatives that the optimal uh, solution is, is that one. You have some matrix inverse times your, your vector. 
And of course, you have to choose lambda, and the higher lambda is, the smoother your image will be. So this is what we get when we do that. This is our original image that we want to recover, and this is what we get with a large value of lambda if we solve that problem starting from the noisy image here. So we have what we want. We have something that looks like the original image, but uh, and with smooth gradient. But is it a good solution? Why not? What's bothering you here? Does it look like a natural image? More or less. If, if you're short-sighted uh, like me, maybe. Okay, the problem here is that it does not look like a natural image because the edges have been blurred. So they are, it's too smooth in some sense. What we would like yes, is to have something that's piecewise smooth. So like, we need to use something else. And one solution is to change the nature of the, the regularizer, not using what we call Tikhonov regularization, the square norm of the spatial gradients. Here we're using another norm, uh, which is called the total variation norm. And what it does is that it takes it removes it basically removes the square and just takes the norm of the spatial gradients. So I'm, for each pixel, I'm Sweet. yeah. Sweet. There's a question. I see. So red, blue, vein. Okay. Question? No. Okay. Um, so yeah, we change the regularizer and it takes something that's slightly different. We take the norm of the gradient, but without the square. It's the only difference, basically. We just sum the horizontal gradient squares and the vertical gradient squares, but take the, the, root, the square root of the sum. It's just a norm, and we sum that over all pixels. And playing a bit with the operations, I can write it in a compact way this way. It's not very important. Now, the, this function rule has a good property because it still enforces my recovery image to be close to the original one, but in addition, it will um, it will uh, have this property of having close pixels that are going to be similar with a large, uh, an important difference is that here, we can show that this, pen, this penalization does not um, uh, penalize too much edges. So we can preserve edges using that. It's having an edge in an image is not going to make this function blow up as opposed to the previous one. So we tolerate that there are discontinuities in our image here and there. So it's exactly what we want because we preserve edges while having something smooth in between. And depending on the value of lambda, this is what we can recover. Something that's relatively smooth or something much smoother with a larger lambda. Again, one issue is that this function is not differentiable anymore because it's not a square norm, it's just a norm. So this is not differentiable. So in those two examples, uh, we see that we need optimization tools that are, that are able to handle non-differentiable non objectives. Um, well, typically your average neural network will be differentiable. Here, those problems are a bit different. But there are, of course, uh, even we, if we have those tools, there are, there are also things that we need to take care of. The estimation of that lambda parameter must be done by hand, and it depends on the data that you're looking at. <clears throat> So you need to tune it manually. A question would be, if for those two problems, it turns out that I can simulate data uh, that have those properties. I can, if I want, draw random uh, dictionary atoms in coefficients that are sparse, generate a solution, and have an example of what it means to have a sparse decomposition of input. Same thing for denoising. If I want, I can take thin images, a thin image, add noise myself, and I have a pair of noisy image, noiseless image. So I can generate some kind of ground truth if I want. I can generate training data for the two problems. Of course, uh, it's not going to be realistic in all cases because uh, typically I'm, I, when I do, when I uh, add noise to an image, I use additive white Gaussian noise, which may or may not be a valid hypothesis for real data, but, but still I can do that. So I can ge generate training data in some sense. So the question is, can I learn that parameter lambda from data instead of hand tuning it. It would be nice to, if I have an image, have a function that's able to compute the regularization parameter, then solve my problem. So can we do that using machine or deep learning? Another related question is, okay, uh, this T 
TV functional might be useful to do the image images, but in some cases might not be optimal as well. It's just uh, a heuristic. I know that's going to be work is going to be working relatively well. But can I learn something different instead? Can I parameterize this function and learn the parameters using my training data? That's another question. Um, and so the and even at a more algorithmic, algorithmic level, I'm going to use iterative algorithms to minimize these functions. And the question is, can I take shortcuts in those algorithms using training data? Can I change some bits in my algorithm instead of closed form expressions, having something that's learned so that I minimize better or faster? So that's the question that we're asking. Uh, and it turns out that the answer of, to some of the questions is yes. And it's thanks to automatic differentiation and deep learning once again. Okay. So before addressing directly that point, we're going to have to make a brief introduction to uh, non-differentiable optimization algorithms. So we'll try to make it uh, simple and intuitive, um, just to understand what's what changes with respect to smooth function minimization. Okay, so let's start with something simple that you've seen in the beginning of the lecture. We have a smooth function, so it's differentiable. It has n variables, outputs a real value, and we want to minimize it without any constraints. So typically, uh, it can be a smooth neural network. It can be anything that you want. It can be quadratic, it can be anything. The go-to method, as you know, is gradient descent. I'm, I want to find a at least a local minimum of my function, okay? And if I'm lucky enough that this function is convex, meaning that uh, all local minima are global minima, I, I can find the global minimum in that case. But we don't have to make that assumption. In any case, with gradient descent, we have this iteration, and we know that if we take this step size small enough, we are guaranteed to converge towards uh, at least a local minimum of the, of the function. So it's conventional gradient descent, nothing new here. So this is an efficient algorithm, but what happens first if we add constraints to the mix? You know, in your network optimization, typically you don't have constraints. It can happen, but in most cases you don't. So what happens if I'm adding a constraint set where my solution has to belong to some set that will also assume to be convex? So to make things simpler and many actual constraints that you have in practice, say your variable has to be, has to have a norm smaller than something, has to have a bound, these constraints are typically convex. In that case, we cannot use gradient descent anymore because it doesn't account for the constraints. But the good news is for simple convex sets, we know how to project on this set efficiently, meaning for a given data point, we know how to find the closest point in that set, uh, the closest point to, in that case, Y, that's in the set C. So in a way, projecting means minimizing that function. I want to minimize the distance between my input data and a point that's in the convex set. So for many examples, this is simple to solve. For example, if your vector needs to have positive coefficients, you just threshold everything that's below zero, and there you, are. There you go, you have your projection. If x is an addition, uh, a vector of proportions, so for example, you have a, a linear combination of something and you know that the coefficients are going to be, to be uh, percentages, okay? Here you have positive coefficients, but now they have to sum to one as well. So here it turns out that there are efficient algorithms to compute the projection on, on such sets. So this step is relatively easy as well. Another example, if I want the norm of my solution to be smaller than something, I have also an, an explicit expression, expression on how to do that. Just renormalize by the right quantity, the vector. If I do that, I'll have a vector that, if its norm is smaller than k, it will not move. And if its norm is larger, I'm going to project it, project it back to the, the, the sphere, okay? So for many examples, uh, computing this projection is easy. So 
it turns out that we can adapt creating descent to handle the, those situations using that concept of projection. So we can rewrite the problem that way if we want. If we want some similar constraint, it's just a, a matter of writing. Now I'm minimizing f of x plus this function here, which is just the indicator function of that variable. In, in, in that sense, indicator function means if my variable satisfies the constraint, it's zero. Otherwise, it's infinite. If my, my point does not satisfy the constraint, I want my function not to be, uh, to be as large as possible and infinite in that case. And no penalization if x is in the constraint set. <coughs> so now we came back to a non-constrained problem. But we added this function, which is not differentiable because it has a discontinuity at the, at the boundary of that set C. Um, and we can also rewrite the projection on the convex set. Same thing as before, it's just now the unconstrained minimization of that function here. The distance plus the indicator function, which is really equivalent to putting it as a constraint. It's just, it's just a, it's the same thing. And for those types of problems, uh, adapting gradient descent is quite easy, in fact. What you simply have to do is to do your, your gradient uh, descent uh, update, just as before, with a small enough set size, and use the, the gradient of f, which is still assumed to be differentiable. And you just have to project every iterate to the constraint set. And remember, this is easy to compute in, in many cases. And by doing that, it looks very simple. The problem is that with this, you don't have guarantees that you're in the constraint set anymore. For example, if you're in a circle, take a step too large, you get outside the, in the disk, you take a step size too large, you get outside of the disk. Here, you just have to project it back. And you can actually show that this will converge to the, the solution of this, of this problem. So it, it's an algorithm that actually works. So it's just a, a simple modification of, um, of gradient descent to handle convex constraints. Easy enough. Now let's try to generalize a bit. And what happens if we want to solve instead of f of x plus the indicator function of some convex set, what happens if we want to minimize the sum of two functions instead? So here, we'll make the assumption that z is not necessarily differentiable. That's the big change with what we've done so far. So for example, z could be the indicator function of a convex set. Let me come back to this previously. But it's more general, of course. So let's try to make an analogy with projection and define some function that minimizes the distance between a given point y plus this non-differentiable function. So it's the same expression as the projection on my convex set, except that now this is more general. This can be any non-differentiable function. <coughs> so what it meant in the projection case is that we look for something that has a small descent with my initial point and is on the constraint set. Here it's similar, except that I want something close to y, but that also locally has a small value for g. So I want to find some kind of uh, point that minimizes g locally around, around y. That's what it means to, to this operator b. And this is just a generalization of projection to arbitrary function. And it's, it's called a proximal operator. And to solve that problem, provided that I know how to solve this problem, if I know how to compute this explicitly, I can just adapt my, my uh, projected gradient descent. I just need to replace the projection with that operator. I do my gradient descent step, and then modify a bit the solution so that it also minimizes G locally. And this uh, can also be shown to converge, provided that uh, G is convex and that you can compute this. <coughs> now, of course, you, need, you still need to have set sizes that are small enough. Okay. Um, it turns out that, yeah, uh, for it's only interesting if that operator is not expensive to compute. If this is as hard to solve as the initial problem, well, it, it's not useful. But again, for many simple functions, this has a close home solution. Very simple to compute. Just uh, plug in the, the, the formula and you're done. A few examples. So if G is some indicator function of a convex set, 
well, we come back to projection. And uh, the, the nonlinear function that we saw in the beginning actually fall into this category, which is nice. So we, if we have the L1 norm, and for this partially in my coefficients, well, after uh, some calculation, I can show that the proximal operator, that so-called generalized projection operator, can be computed with this formula. It doesn't really matter uh, what the, the formula is. I just need to know that I can solve it explicitly. If I have the L2 norm, not squared, which makes it non-differentiable, I also have a solution here. And L2 norm also works. You have very simple expressions in many cases. And this one was useful to our uh, fast regression problem. Well, this one was useful for our image denoising problem. So we have hoped to be able to solve those uh, problems using iterative algorithms such as um, proximal gradient descent. <coughs> okay. So with this, we know how to minimize sums of two functions, one of which is differentiable, and the other may not be, but we call we, it has to be proximable in the sense that this proximal operator needs to have a simple expression. If D is such a function, I can I can apply um, proximal gradient descent. So a natural question to ask is what happens if I want to stack a bunch of these functions that may not be differentiable and add several of them. F is differentiable, but those two might not be. Well, I can adapt uh, those these proximal gradient algorithms using more complex schemes to handle that case. So I'm not going to talk, uh, talk about this, but you can do it. Another issue might be, OK, what happens if I just have two functions? Um, one of them is differentiable. This one might not be, but in addition, I have a linear operator that comes up, meaning that D has not the same domain as F. F takes a vector in x, n, and g takes a vector in whatever the dimension of hx is. Here, you cannot directly use uh, the previous uh, algorithm, because those functions do not have the same domain. <coughs> so the gradients are going, um, well, this one is not differentiable. So we, we have to find something else. And mind you, this matches the case of our uh, denoising problem because in that case, H is that finite difference operator that computes the vertical and horizontal differences. So there's uh, an active uh, research area in, uh, in optimization that tries to solve for these kinds of problems. In our case, we just are going to give an algorithm that we'll use in practice to minimize this kind of function. It doesn't really matter exactly where it comes from. I'll just try to go through it intuitively. But the idea is that we have a differentiable function. So typically in our case, it's going to be a data fit term. We want to minimize the distance between my solution and the initial data. Plus that thing that may or may not be there, but if it's there, for example, it's boundary constraints. For example, for images, I may want my pixels to be between zero and 255 or between zero and one, for example. And this is going to be my so-called total variation term, the, the term that's not differentiable and uh, enforces piecewise smooth images. So in that case, there's an efficient algorithm. There are many algorithms to solve this problem, but one that's relatively uh, compact is that one. So the formulas may, may look a bit scary, but if you decompose them, it's actually not that uh, fancy. So here you have two steps, which is the difference between uh, that and a proximal gradient descent. But if you take them individually, they both look like, uh, well, a gradient descent step and some pro kind of generalized projection operator. So in this one, you use the, the generalized projection related to that function. And here you have um, something that looks a lot like radi a gradient. And in that one, you have another uh, variable. It's not x anymore, it's s. And s has the dimension of h times x. So if h computes gradients, your output has is two images. 
instead of one, one of vertical gradients, one of horizontal gradients, and you stack them together and you get a big vector of time of dimensions two times n. So you make a gradient step in that space, use the proximal operator, a gradient step in that space, and use another proximal operator that's related to this function now. And if you iterate those, you are going to converge towards a, a solution um, of that. And the solution is this function happens to be convex, which is the case for um, our total variation denoising problem. <coughs> so in a way, it's just two proximal gradient different steps, except that each time you're using a different proximal operator. And you can have conditions on the step sizes because now you have two, you have a row that's lacking in gradient distance and another one that's related to the other part. And you can have relationships between both to ensure convergence. Not necessary to go through them, but you can make sure that this is going to converge. <coughs> well, as I said, there are many uh, different solutions for this, uh, different algorithmic solutions to solve this problem. This one is, a, is an old popular one, but I'm not going to go through it in detail. Uh, it's just that I couldn't not mention it because it's one of the most used methods to do that, just that we're not going to use it today. And it might be less int intuitive than um, the one we previously saw that is just an augmented uh, projected gradient. It's called ADMM and uh, is quite flexible because it, it allows you to handle as many differentiable, non-differentiable terms as you want. But understanding it requires a bit of uh, optimization background, so I'm not going to go through it. I just want to mention it in case you ever need it. But if you just take a quick look at the iterations in that case, you see that the idea is that you have sums of several um, functions that may or may not be differentiable and you come back to an algorithm where each step involves the proximal operator of, the, the, of one of the functions, just one, not uh, several. You know how to handle one function, but the sum of two functions is complicated. So what you do is design schemes to come back to some problems which are easy to solve. It's just the basic idea. But let's not go uh, through detail, in the, into details. It's just that this proximal operator concept if you happen to know how to compute it, it's very efficient to uh, minimize sums of non-differentiable functions. It's, it comes back all the time and simplifies things greatly. Okay, so this is enough in, uh, to, to get circulars through today. Just the idea was to give you a, a quick idea of how to minimize non-differentiable functions. And we gave two examples of, on, of when this could be interesting. Now we're going to move on to the part where we are using machine learning combined with some of those algorithms in order to make them better in some sense. <coughs> okay. Uh, so what we want to do here is to use ground truth data, training data of pairs of solutions and uh, data. So in the sparse regression case, we wanted to go from uh, an observation to a set of coefficients that would be sparse. In the denoising problem, we want to go from a noise image to a noise free image. And in both those cases, we, in, we can generate uh, training data artificially if we want by designing sparse linear combinations of some uh, dictionary atom in the first case, or just uh, adding noise artificially to images in the second. And the question is, how can we use those training pairs um, to augment those algorithms? So for example, one, even if you have an, uh, an, an, a simple function to minimize, there's still the question of, even if you can do gradient descent or something like that, you still have the question of how do I tune the step size at each step? So if you want to optimize neural network, you will choose some kind of learning rate and hope for the best, hope that Adam is going to try to adapt it in order that it works. But you don't have really the rules to, to solve them. And rules to get those are not straightforward and um, not easy to obtain in practice. You can have heuristics, things that will work in some cases, but you don't have optimal uh, ways of, of tuning that except in very simple problems. So if you want to optimize the step size in a, 
once we integrate this step, so for example, if this is uh, the negative gradient, you know that um, if you take something small enough, you're going to decrease your function, okay. But what you would like to do is to decrease it as much as possible. So you need to solve another optimization problem. And again, except in very simple cases where f is uh, super simple, this is at, at least as hard to solve as the initial problem. So not very reassuring. Um, but more general, so one question could be, can we use uh, the training data to find optimal ways of tuning that? And the answer is yes. Um, more generally, we, uh, Kersh told us uh, earlier that training descent is the go-to method, meaning that this DK is usually a negative gradient. In more generality, it can be any descent direction. What's a descent direction? It's something, it's a vector, a direction in my space, such that if I, I know that if I go in that direction, starting from xk, with a step size that's not too large, I know that I'm going to decrease my function a bit, at least. So the negative gradient is a good choice. But more generally, any function satisfying this, any vector satisfying this is going to work. It needs to be uh, just, if you think geometrically, so the negative gradient is collinear to the gradient, so dk uh, uh, minimizes this actually, minimizes this inner product, but more generally, a direction can be something that's vaguely aligned with the gradient, that way, that's what it is because locally the gradient is the direction that uh, leads to the, the steepest decrease. So I can choose anything that is vaguely aligned with the gradient and that's what this inner product represents. So for example, if you go to second order methods, the Newton method uses uh, a DK that's the gradient, the negative gradient, but uh, multiplied by secondary, the matrix of second derivatives. And this satisfies this property if your function is nice enough. And in some cases, it can work better. Okay. So another question would be, okay, uh, grain descent might be limited because it only uses uh, simple in first order information. What I may want to find is an optimal value of that um, descent direction from data, tune it from data. So that my algorithm is some kind of descent algorithm, but not grain descent, something descent. Uh, so I want to find both the step size and the direction in that case. <coughs> so the best descent direction is a priori unknown. We know that the brain works well on average in many cases, and the step size needs to, be, needs to be tuned, but why not learning those from data? <coughs> so researchers have tried to have tried doing this recently. So uh, the idea is that they are going to generate training data by, for example, I want an optimizer because that's what I'm learning. I'm learning an algorithm to minimize a function and I want it to be uh, efficient on a certain class of problems. For example, it can be simple quadratic problems, least squares problems. I generate a matrix W and, and vectors, uh, I don't know, A, and I want to minimize the distance between W, X and X, least squares. And I'll, for several types of W and B, I want an algorithm to work well in those cases. And so for that, I happen to know the solution. So I can generate training data and try to find an algorithm that looks like that. What I want to learn is the function G here. Hopefully, G leading to iterations that are going to decrease my function very efficiently at each iteration. So it's more general than gradient descent because this now is learned. This is parameterized. By exam for example, by a neural network. <clears throat> the question is, uh, how do I know my optimizer is good? How do I know that this descent direction is good? So I'm learning an update tool, and this update tool takes parameters. So for example, the parameters of a neural network. I, it's a function that uh, takes as input, uh, well, dk. DK is the available information at that, at that time. So for example, it can be simply uh, a trajectory of X0, if, if X0 is your initialization, 
two x t, where t is some fixed number. So x zero x t is the trajectory of the point. It can take that as information. It can also take the gradients if you want. You know that gradient works well, so why not feeding it to the, why not learning a function that takes the gradient information so that it doesn't have to um, recover it from data. You know that the great combinations of nonlinear transformations of the gradients are more likely to work than nonlinear transformations of something that's not useful. So yeah, we can give this information also to, to that, that function. So it's something that takes uh, trajectories as, in, as inputs and it's parameterized by a certain number of parameters. Uh, and we want to optimize for phi now. So it's a bit, uh, we have to really think about what we're doing. We have an iterative algorithm, think about gradient descent, except that you allow the gradient to be something else that's learned from data. And you want the solution of this uh, iterative process, so X uh, capital T, for example, to minimize your function. So in order to train those parameters, you have to design a new, uh, a new criterion. A new criterion will be, okay, once I have trained phi, I want f of x capital T to be small. It's reasonable, that's what we want to do. We want to find something that will minimize our function. Uh, and okay, here there is some, because maybe I'm not just interested in something that minimizes the function in the end, at the end of my iterative process, of my iterative uh, descent algorithm. Maybe I want something that uh, decreases the function well at each time. So I can also involve f of x0, f of x1, f of x2, until f of, f of x capital T. So that I have something that's not, not just optimal in the end, but optimal throughout. And I have a set of weights to choose. Simplest, uh, those are some picks. For example, I can just take one for the last time step and zero for the others. And in this case, I just want um, uh, my function to be minimized once I'm finished. But I can also weight the different uh, iterates. So that's the idea of what we call model free approaches because here there's no real algorithm, optimization algorithm uh, underneath. It's, the, it's just a distance algorithm and I need to learn, well, the direction I want to go uh, given my input data at a given time step. <coughs> so the thing is, what I'm looking for is a trajectory of points in the end. I want something that once trained, given x0, gives me a trajectory that minimizes my function. So what I want to recover in the end, it's uh, the input of my algorithm is, is sequential. It's a, it's a it's a so called a time series of uh, iterates. So a natural choice is to take advantage of correlation between neighboring samples. And to do that, if you if we are going to use neural networks, one strategy could be LSTM or recurrent neural networks more generally, which are able to take uh, uh, temporal correlations into account. Uh, and as I said, the input of that LSTM is going to be the current trajectory, the current trajectory of my point, and possibly gradient information, because I still know that this is valuable. I may want to do better, but I know that this is going to be helpful to my, to my network, so I, I can feed it with that as well. So how it goes is that I start from initial value of my phi that parameterizes my optimizer. I start from initial sequences of x, my, so my solution and the, uh, possibly the gradients. We pass them through a forward pass of that LSTM so that we get a sequence. And then we update the parameters phi um, by minimizing that function. So there's another minimization problem. Your network basically takes, uh, well, you want to find sets of parameters that minimize this loss function, knowing that the inputs of that loss functions are already solutions of an optimization problem. So there are two nested problems here. So, because what you want to train is something that minimizes other things. So that's why you can do that efficiently with neural networks because the only thing that you do is to be able to 
code those operations in PyTorch, for example. You, and then you let uh, Adam do the work for you and, and uh, PyTorch can be doing it. So in practice, your forward method in PyTorch will be C iterations of that update. And you, so if you see it as a black box, it takes as input uh, an initial point. It, it spits a trajectory of iterates. And those trajectories are function of pi. And then you use uh, PyTorch and Adam to modify pi so that your, optimizer, your optimizer is better. And there's a last thing I haven't talked about, which of course you want that to be uh, efficient for in average for all the tasks uh, in your training set. So all the optimization process that you design by hand. So for example, if you want to train something that's efficient on these squares, well, you are going to have a large number of quadratic functions with parameters that are going to be randomly sampled, for example. <clears throat> so here you, you are using um, input output pairs of data solutions to learn optimizer. And we learn that optimizer using optimization procedures that are using in neural networks. So that's why uh, one of the first uh, group that proposed things like this use that title for that paper, learning to learn by gradient descent, by gradient descent. Because you're essentially doing a gradient descent and want to optimize the gradient, the distant direction. And to do that, you have to solve another optimization problem. So there are nested optimization uh, problems. So it's really that. You want to learn optimization algorithm by gradient descent. That might be maybe easier to understand, but that optimization algorithm already optimizes things. So that's the idea. <laughs> um, okay, so those are called model tree approaches because we're not using any specific optimization algorithm. We're just having a general descent algorithm and we learn the direction. Um, so the good thing is, uh, is that I can specialize it to uh, type of problem I want to solve. If I want an optimizer to be very efficient on sparse regression problems, well, I can I can train it to do that. If I want uh, it to be efficient on image denoising, okay, I can do that as well. And it, you can show that uh, you can optimize uh, functions you have been trained on faster uh, and better than some uh, classical optimization algorithm, say gradient descent. But of course, the drawback is that you have to uh, know to have training data, to know how to get solution from, uh, or at least to have an idea of what the solution would be. But then you hope you can generalize it, generalize to other problems of the same kind with different parameters. There are a bunch of drawbacks though. You need the objective to be differentiable since if you want to use gradient information in your, as input, well, it's not very interpretable. The only thing you know is that in the end you'll get something that's basically a descent direction algorithm, but you don't know much more than that. One big thing that you're losing is convergent guarantee. You don't know that for smaller, small enough values of a step size, you're going to converge and the algorithm will not blow up because you don't have step sizes anymore here and you don't know what's happening in this direction. So unless, unless you can somehow uh, hot cable this into your optimization algorithm, you, don't, you won't have guarantees on that. And also it can be memory intensive and time consuming because uh, what you're essentially doing is using an, an algorithm, iterative algorithm, doing a certain number of iterations of it. And this is what you want to differentiate through using PyTorch. So your computational graph can get quite big because you're essentially unrolling an algorithm and want everything to be differentiable within it. So that's obviously a drawback and it can lead to memory issues and computation. <laughs> okay, maybe something that's more reasonable or um, at least interpretable could be, okay, I don't want to learn everything from scratch. I want to use an, an, existing, an existing optimization algorithm and just want to optimize on what I don't know. Typically, I'm doing image denoising what I don't know for a given input data is, well, the regularization parameter, how strong must be my regularizer 
should I be noise or not, or just a little, depending on the, the level of noise. And possibly there are other things that may be unknown, such as step sizes in the algorithm that I choose to solve it. So if I'm doing proximal gradient, for example, I have a step size to tune each iteration. So maybe I can want to, to just learn that, step sizes and uh, regularization parameters. So what we would like to do, using still our uh, solutions that we have, so our, our pairs of noiseless, noisy mixes, what you want to do in the end is use some algorithm that computes, well, the, minim the minimum of, in that case, it's going to be my uh, CV uh, total variation functional. Um, sorry, it's a minimization over X. For a given regularization parameter, what I want to do is find the minimum over X. But that is going to depend on, on the, this should be spelled, oh sorry. This going, is going to depend on the value of that regularization parameter. For any, for a given input data, depending on the value of tau, I will have different solution. So I have a function, this uh, minimizer is a function of lambda itself, or so it is a function of the regularization parameter. Maybe what I want to do is just finding the optimal one. So that function, a real uh, a function, a function that has uh, just one uh, parameter, input parameter, and I'll put something that has the same size as a, a Airbus image, basically. Maybe I want to find the optimal uh, lambda so that I'm closest to, um, to the, the true solution. And this can be only done for a, a single image. If I have an image, okay, I have to know the truth, but for that image, I can, I can look for the optimal regularization parameter using that ST. So again, this is a nested optimization problem. I want to minimize some functional, but that functional is already the solution of another minimization problem. Um, so the trick, if I want to use PyTorch to do that, is to replace that complex minimization by something iterative. So for example, it can be the algorithm I presented to you earlier that is able to minimize this functional. I use n iterations of that algorithm. And if I code that in PyTorch, in the end I get something that I, I can differentiate with respect to anything, thanks to automatic differentiation. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to differentiate that X of lambda with respect to lambda and use Adam, SGD, whatever, to optimize that function now. So I have two functions. I have the solution to my problem, initial problem, and I want that solution to be updated so that it matches the real solution as, as good as possible. And what you'll do in the lab session after is basically do that for a bunch of different X stars. And once you have that, you have uh, for uh, several inputs, the optimal uh, regularization parameter. And if you want to, in the end, have something completely adaptive, what you can do is then use some kind of regression algorithm to go from an image to the optimal regularization parameter. So two steps. First, for a bunch of images, solve that bi-level optimization problem. So you have the optimal values of lambda and possibly some other things. And then just learn a regression from an input image to that parameter so that you can generalize to new images that you haven't, on which you haven't applied this procedure. So hopefully in the end, given any image, if it works, you can recover the solution and the optimal par uh, regularization parameter by trying to generalize to use, use two images. Okay. Uh, so that's the idea, and that's what you'll do in the lab session. But more generally, uh, using mo what we call model-based approach, the idea is to, you have your favorite algorithm to minimize the problem. It's just that you don't know regularization parameters or you don't know step sizes or anything. Just code it as you would, implement it as you would, just in PyTorch, so that it's differentiable. Then you can truncate an iterative solution at some time step. For example, t equals uh, 20 make 20 iterations um, and optimize everything else uh, using, uh, using uh, uh, PyTorch. Another way to have more flexibility would be, okay, maybe optimizing over just one or a few parameters 
is not going to improve much the solution. So maybe I want just to change a, a part of my algorithm. So for example, um, and this is the last slide before moving on to the lab. Um, if I come back to my sparse regression problem, so I choose manually choose lambda, and I, I can solve this using proximal gradient, for example. And in that case, the iteration looks like that. I have a gradient descent here. This is the gradient of the function. And I apply this uh, proximal operator. And the idea would be to apply similar uh, things, but not just tune the step size or lambda or both, but to replace those matrices here, A transpose A or A transpose B by something that I will learn. So this way, I have something that looks like an algorithm that I know to work, but it can take shortcuts because it doesn't have to be the exact gradient. It can be something else. Oh, okay, I will initialize those with the, so that it matches the true gradient, but I allow my algorithm to take shortcuts if I want to, to get to learn something different that will work better in practice. And so that, in that particular uh, instance, um, the proximal gradient is called E star for some reason. Um, and this scheme of learning a part of it, replace parts of it with trainable parameters is called the ISTA for learn ISTA. And you can show that if you train this on a bunch of sparse regression problem where the data A and B are randomly sampled, in the end you get something that's very efficient for these types of problems with new values of A and B. And in some cases, faster, converging, fa converging faster with uh, less iteration than classical algorithm. And maybe you can try to learn that in the, in the mix. Okay, um, so just to summarize, there are two ways of using um, training data to learn optimizer. One is to just learn a general descent algorithm by having an update tool that's simple, x of k plus one equals xk plus something that I learn and hope that the trajectory that I get will minimize the functions I'm interested in. Another way that may be more reasonable or simpler is to use an existing algorithm and augmenting it with the automatic differentiation to learn what I'm missing. It might be a regularization parameter. It might be uh, some sub problem, some update that's inside the algorithm, or it can be a modified version of it. The idea is to get something that's either more efficient or more, uh, more efficient computationally or more effective in terms of precision um, than uh, an off the shelf algorithm. But to do that, you have to optimize things using uh, automatic differentiation that are already solutions optimization problems. So there are nested optimization issues in that case. Okay, uh, so I'll stop here for the lecture and we can move on to the lab session. So I think Ronan uh, put the, the data and the, and the notebook on the, on the Discord server. Oh, okay. Uh, let me stop sharing and have a look at it. <coughs> the X, the question is, the X in the second equation is a non mean on X and not on top. Yeah, uh, yeah, I said it briefly. I'm sorry, there was a typo in my, in my slide here. Either uh, all the, it should be either every, everywhere lambda instead of tau or everywhere tau instead of lambda. I just need two different notations for the parameter. But yes, if I, I use lambda here, it should be lambda here and lambda here as well. Sorry for that typo. Okay. <laughs> so, um, in the lab session, so we don't have too, too much time, but it's, it's okay. You don't have too many things to, to, to do and um, you'll have access to the solutions. The idea here is to uh, try to learn an adaptive denoising algorithm. So what we'll do is we have an image 
So here it's a, what we call a panchromatic image. It's a satellite image. This one has been acquired over London. Um, and what you have is something that is gray level, but the, we have a very high spatial resolution. And what we'll do is, uh, because it's a very large image and we want to get something that's uh, optimizable or run for lab, we'll divide that image into patches, okay, of uh, size 128 by 128. And what we would like to do is for each patch, artificially, artificially generate a noisy image with different uh, noise intensity, okay? So that you have a training set of noiseless and noisy images with different levels. And for a bunch of those images, what we'll do is by using an iterative algorithm and automatic differentiation, learn the optimal value for the regularization parameter controlling the, the power of the denoising and the step size of uh, the iterative algorithm. So that's the idea. For a bunch of images, I'm going to look for optimal values of those two things. And the, there's a second step where we try to generalize that to other images. And in that case, the idea would be to, okay, for a certain number of images, I've obtained optimal values for the regularization of the step sizes. And I'll try to set up a small neural network to learn the relationship between the noise image and those parameters. If I do this efficiently and, that it, and it generalizes, I can, for any new input data, find some estimates of the, the parameters and use that in a conventional algorithm. So that's what we'll try to do here. Um, and the algorithm we'll use, so the problem is uh, that one, triple variation regularization. And we use, we'll use that um, uh, two-step algorithm um, to solve the problem. So the good news is um, it's already coded for you. So you just have to set up the, the training phase to optimize over uh, the parameters for different images. So here you have a bunch of imports as usual. So I'm, I'm working locally on my computer, but uh, of course you, you, may, you may need GPUs. So uh, you have the color version uh, accessible. Uh, maybe I'll open it so that I have exactly the same thing as you. 